So we've been in this detox journey and detox series, and it's really all about this idea of like fasting and taking things and, and replacing natural desires, natural things that you do, whether it be um, an action or whether it be uh, a, a food or something, all in, not because that thing is bad or, or something like that necessarily, but all because we're realizing that there is a whole nother life, a whole nother reality, a whole nother world that really we're only seeing part of at the moment. And so we've been in this idea of replacement and detoxing away, not because the things are bad, right? But why? Because there's just something over here that seems to be real and true that we need to grasp hold of with this. And this is something that we call spirit, and the things that we do on a daily are called natural, right? It's pretty simple, right? Like we are natural people, poke the person beside you just to make sure they're still awake because I'm about to say some important stuff. Natural. But yet... There is something inside of you that is something we call spirit, something that's really you can't put under a microscope. You can't really fully understand what it is. Some people call it consciousness. Some people call it intuition. Some people call it your mind. It's all these. We use all these names to kind of try to get around this idea of there's something categorically different about human beings than seems to be about every other piece of creation. And that part is called spirit. But if you are a spirit with a body, Everything runs off of some type of fuel, yes? Every car that you have, believe it or not, I know some of us think the gas gauge is lying when it's on E. We're like, nope, not filling up for 100 bucks, not doing it. It's lying. No, it takes fuel to function, to run. Your body takes fuel, yes? That's what food is, right? So the question becomes, what, what's the fuel of the spirit, of the true you that's inside of there? What is the fuel of that? Well, some people would say, it's the Bible, I haven't even got to the fun part yet. No, it's this thing that we call prayer, which is basically a conversation with God. For instance, I'm about to help everybody in your marriage on two points. One's coming right now. If you're married, thinking about being married. So all of the young kids that are single and everything like that, start listening to me now so you don't screw up your life like your parents have, okay? Not your parents. What is the fuel of a relationship in general? Conversation. The number one reason that people end up getting divorced is usually not because of cheating on each other and stuff like that, actually. Because the cheating happened much later because you stopped talking to each other. Wow, it got real silent real quick. Did I just hit a nerve? I think I did. This is not even where we're going, so this is just, this is just for somebody right now, for, for all you church folk. It's conversation is the fuel of a relationship. So if we say we're in relationship with God, the fuel source of that is conversation. But yet it's the one thing we don't do with God, isn't it? Oh, yes, I do pray. No, no, no. You want to have, I just realized this last night, I used this example with my children, and, or more with my wife, but my children were present. You guys want the type of relationship with God called a goldfish relationship. You want God to be like a goldfish. It's pretty, and it sits in a bowl, it stays contained within that bowl, and it basically requires nothing of you other than go up and look at it and say, isn't that pretty? And you put a little food in it, and you watch it, and you say, whoa, isn't that cool? And then you just go about your daily life. It's the best pet to have, yes? What is the first pet you get a child? A fish. Why? It requires nothing of you. And that's the why, it's type of relationship that we want with God. We just want it to look pretty, set there, contained, don't, don't get anywhere else, don't run around my house like a dog would do, definitely don't be like a child that requires everything of me. Like, don't do that, just set in this, and then I'll just kind of sprinkle some stuff on it, and I'll just kind of ask for a few things and do a few things, and then it just kind of makes me feel good because it's like, pretty, I have a pet, I feel so good about it. I'm giving back to the animal kingdom. And then you move on. But that's not the type of fuel. It's a conversation, a deep, meaningful one. Now, the big question comes to this. Why would you want to give up all of this good, fun stuff? Why would you want to be a weirdo and a crazy man or woman and give that stuff up for something over here that seems very intangible? For talking to the flying spaghetti monster in the sky. That's basically, I could describe God in any way. 
and you wouldn't know the difference. So why would we give up to talk to an imaginary friend? And that's the problem. We think of it as quite imaginary. It's quite intangible. It's really not real. One of the most interesting statements I've ever heard from people um, in different stories and things that they've told me and so on and so forth and is whenever a situation comes up in life, right, and they're saying, and then someone inevitably, and they're saying about all their problems and situation, and someone inevitably that believes in this idea of this spirit realm being quite real quotes a scripture or says we need to pray, and they say, I know, but I'm talking about real life. Who's ever said that in all honesty? Come on, in your heart. You may not have said it out loud. You have to raise your hand, otherwise I'm going to start call, t- t- teaching about lying. Because every person in this room at some point has encountered a situation in life in which the answer inevitably for sure, the, you didn't know what the answer was, but you knew it was not praying. You knew it was not reading your Bible. You knew it was nothing about God. You knew the answer lied somewhere in your psyche and that you could come up with an answer in this natural world. Yes or no? Raise your hand for Yes. Keep lying and keep your hand down if the answer is no. Every one of us have. Why? It's because that side doesn't seem all that real. And it doesn't seem all that real because you haven't been really told the whole story. So I'd like to just share with you a little bit of why this is valuable and important. Now, there's all kinds of different arguments as to discuss why this is important. For instance, the belief that there even is a God and an existence of God, I think one of the most compelling arguments for this whole idea that God does exist is not the Bible. It's actually you. I believe one of the most compelling arguments about it is this. This is my personal belief. This may not hit you as strong as it hits me, but I think it will. Think about this just for a moment, just for a second. What is it about you that you look at this world And you immediately expect it to be different. Not just different, but better. Why? Do you see dogs running around and talking and whining about how life should be better than what it is? No. Life is life. They just do what they do. Have you ever seen a tree decide it just doesn't like where it's planted, so it just gets up and moves somewhere else? No. (laughs) They're inanimate objects. A dog's not. But yet it doesn't see that. How about the goldfish in the little... It just swims around happy as a lark. Or rather, I guess, as a goldfish, because it's not a lark. But Why? There's something about you that's different. That, that consciousness, that intuition, that whatever it is about you, you look at this world and you say, hmm, I want it to be better. Who has whined about that in your life? Again, don't lie. Raise your hand. All of us lie all the time, but let it not be now. No, we do. We look at life and we wish and want it to be better. And then not only that, you could say, well, that's just survival, Jared, and evolution. No, but then there's something about you that sees someone else that you don't even know. And you hear about a story that happens on the other side of the world. And it's a tragic story. And there's something in you that said that shouldn't have happened. That shouldn't be. And you want to go help. I was laughing at Dustin. If you guys don't know Dustin, he's a guy with a beard and short like a gnome. And he drives trucks, and he's a, he's a, <laughs> he is a, an interesting character if you haven't met him. You should meet him. And I remember many years, this is maybe three years ago, it was when a bunch of persecution was happening over uh, somewhere in Africa. I don't remember where, but they were, they, they were killing Christians. And Dustin was like, three words of Steph is all that kept him from like, let's go buy guns and start killing these other people for God. Like, let's just do it. Like, there was something, now again, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, but he literally was like, what do you think? Like, I could go for a couple months and then come back, like, you know, and help, and help this. What, what, what is that? There's something inside of him that said, this is unjust, and I don't think it should be, and I want to do something about it. Now, his wife's logic and reason prevailed in that. Otherwise, you would not be able to even meet this guy, Dustin, because... I think he'd be stuck over there. But what am I saying? There's something categorically different about you that seems to make you look around and say it should be better. Yes? What is that? That's the spirit side of things. I think that's one of the most compelling arguments to understand you are not a processing meat computer. 
that just takes in information and just reacts to it? Is there something about you that has this nature that wants to see goodness come? And I think that's one of the most compelling arguments to prove you are more than just this natural body. And then if that's true, that must mean it came from somewhere. And that's what I want to talk to you about just briefly before we really get on some more of this detox side of things. Because this is the most important piece. Is if, if that's true, that there's something about you that seems to transcend this natural world. Remember, poke your neighbor real quick. Poke, poke, poke. There's something about you that's more than that body. Where did it come from? If it transcends this natural world, it had to come from something that also transcends this natural world. Transcends means to be beyond or above, okay? Just in case we need to lower the the reading level here a little bit. It moves beyond it. Well, what would that being be like? Well, we do have some texts, ancient texts, been around for You know, give or take 6,000 years, you could argue different dates. And man, ancient man understood this and knew this, and they used this term, this idea that we commonly now call God. There is a being that exists quite separate, but yet immediately involved in this natural world that caused it to be. Now, the book that that comes out of, we call Genesis, and it happens in verse 1, chapter 1. And it says, in the beginning, before all things were anything, God, this being that created that part of you that we just talked about and created the physical you, created the heavens and the earth. And this means the unseen and the seen, the things above and the things below, everything. You can't escape it everywhere you go. The whole idea of existence, God thought of it. God invented existence. Think about that for a minute, right? You know someone that invents something, and you're like, they thought of this cool idea. God thought of the idea of existence. He was like, hey, I, I am this thing, and you know what? Someday, way down in the future, they're going to use a word called existence, and it's going to mean to be. Now, we see this elsewhere, and it's called I am. I exist. And, it's, and he's like, I want to create an entire universe that exists. And in that universe, I want to make a mini-me. One billion. <laughs> I want to make something that's very similar and like me, not exactly me, like, you know, like kind of like a child of mine, you know, that's kind of what I want to do. And I want them to, to learn to be like me and keep doing this good work. That's what I want. And enters man on the scene, all of us. Now, maybe not you, unless you're like, I feel that old sometimes, but enters man on the scene. And this is why we must re-examine our lives and say, if that is true, if there's a being that created all things that wants me to continue his good work, and that being is not inherently just natural, it's not really primarily natural by any stance, it's this other thing called spirit that I kind of try to interpret as my consciousness and my thoughts and my mind and my intuition and all that kind of stuff. If If that's true... I need to start fueling that thing because that thing seems to transcend this natural world. And that's what this detox is all about. That's what this replacement is all about. It's not about this idea that, you know what, guys? That God that we just talked about, you screwed up. And you're so horrible and so screwed up that God has created a place that now he wants to send you to for all eternity if you do not say the right thing, do the right thing, and be the right thing. So you better get it together, and you better start fasting and replacing things, because otherwise God's not going to be very happy with you. That is not the story. Matter of fact, all of you Bible scholar people that think that that's in that story, it's not in there. That's not the story. The story goes that after we betrayed... God still constantly said, but I really, really want to see this be what I wanted it to be, and I really, really, really want you to do it. So I am going to go to every length possible to show you and illustrate to you what I want and who I am. And he does this through all the prophets of the Old Testament. He does this through people throughout all of history. But there's this one dude that we talked about last week that was like just the precipice, the pinnacle, the end result of all of it. And he says, this is the one that you can count on. To look at and say, that's the one. Now, we call this dude Jesus. Now, I know some of you are like, he just called Jesus a dude. That's so disrespectful. I think Jesus would be walking around right now being, what's up, dude? That guy. 
is the one we look at. This real story goes is that God at the beginning, because this being that we're talking about that created all things, okay, y'all following me? Y'all tracking with me where we're at? This reality of this spiritual being that created everything seen and unseen and all of that kind of stuff, the reason you exist, the reason you look at the world and think it should be better is because what he wanted to do is you to continue his good work. That's why you look at the world and say, why isn't it better? And the answer is you. We are the reason it's not better. Because we keep feeding natural things, which only ends in destruction and chaos and everything like that. And we just keep heaping it on and saying, well, maybe if we just keep feeding that, at some point we'll figure it out. Instead of realizing the true life, the true, the true ultimate reality lies in something much deeper than that. And even when we did all of that, see, this God that we're talking about that did all of that, he is something that we commonly may hear as omni, which means all present, omnipresent, which means he is everywhere simultaneously because he is not contained because he's not natural like you. You can only be one place at one time, okay? Whoever feels like, man, I wish I could be multiple places at one time, life would be so much easier. I would clone myself and have them do all the work and I'd just sit and do nothing. But you're not that. You're like God, but not that part. You're confined within this one space, but he is not. And so he's also all-knowing, because if all things were made by him, all the unseen and seen things, he thought of the idea of bringing it into existence, so if that's the case, then he knew everything, which would then mean, are y'all tracking this logic and reason? I told you to wake up and pay attention. That means if it is true, and I am beyond the natural things, then I must replace to gain this fuel. I must gain this fuel because there is a being that knew all, saw all, and at the very beginning said he wanted me to continue this good work. So I'm not trying to do it to earn his love and affection. I'm doing it because I've already got it, and that was the intentional role. That was the purpose of my existence. That is the purpose of your existence. And this God at the beginning saw all of that. Saw all the betrayal, saw everything at the beginning and still said, I'm going to risk it. Like, I still think this is a good idea. So how about us who sit and say this was a bad idea? We're disagreeing with the knowledge of a being far beyond you, and you think it was a bad idea, and he says it's a good idea. And from the very beginning, the very, very beginning, he saw all of that, but he saw that guy that we were talking about, that dude, Jesus. At the very beginning, he saw, but there's one in all of this humanity, there's one that said yes, and that is going to continue my good work. And because of that one, I'll say yes to the rest of you. That is crazy. That would be, <laughs> that's a bad example. <laughs> That would be like if you took, I have three children, and that would be like if two of them were just duds. They're just lemons out of the box, you know? <laughs> they just ain't quite working out, you know? One fry short of a Happy Meal. They're not the yellow in the crayon box. All of those. But there's one, but, and I treat them as a lump sum. And two of them, y'all can guess which two they are. These two dull-headed boys, right? <laughs> Why'd you do that? <laughs> but then I went to them and I said, hey, I treat y'all as a whole. And you guys on your own, man, <laughs> let me tell you something. I would be taking you back to the dealership. <laughs> but because of that other one, your other sibling, your, your sister, because she makes up the difference. I'll keep you two. Now, y'all are laughing because y'all think that's ludicrous. But that's how you think God sits over here and says, nope, you're out. You're out. No, I'm just going to keep that one. That one did it right. So you're out. You're out. It's as if you can no longer be his child because you didn't behave properly. Some of you are like, well, that's kind of been my experience. I misbehaved and my parents and I, and they kind of did kick me out. Well, good thing God's not like your parents. God's like my parents. My parents were awesome. All right, cool. Yeah, my parents were awesome because I screwed up a lot, like a lot. Like I hope my kids don't do what I did because I hope I would have the patience that if one of my children totaled a vehicle, like right now because I was about Jade's age, I didn't even get in trouble for it. Well, kind of, but <laughs> not compared to the rest. No, 
Your parents are not God, but yet God has said all of you are accepted because of that one. He said, so, would you like to start fueling that side of you that's like me? That, so you can, you can look like that. That one, you, you can start looking like that. You just got to start fueling. If we were to look at Jesus, okay, and kind of peek under the hood of his life, so to speak, okay, you know, like see what he's running off of. You know, I'm not a car guy, and I hate Fast and Furious, but, you know, all the scenes are like propping up the hood and stuff like that, and I'm like, I thought the car ran better with the hood down. I don't know, but, you know, and they're all looking inside of what's in the car. Who's a car guy in here or cares about engines of any kind? Okay, some of you, okay? I don't care in the slightest, okay? Matter of fact, just the other day, someone was like, what kind of engines does your wife's car have in it? I was like, it says V8. But what kind? A V8. <laughs> got eight valves. I'm pretty sure that's what that stands for. That's, that's all I got for you. But if we were to kind of peek under the hood of what Jesus was doing, we would find what he was fueling primarily was this other side of who he was. So much so that yes, uh, yesterday, yeah, last Sunday was yesterday in my mind right now. <laughs> so much so that last week we were looking at it and he said, I'm so concerned about fueling that side of me that I'm not even going to fuel this side for 40 straight days. That's how important that is. If we were to peek under the hood, we'd, we'd see this guy that had this worldview of such a reality of this. It was so important that he was willing to risk everything and did risk everything in death and in life, so real that the very manner that he did life was based off of what that said, not what his body said. And this is called a fast. This is called a detox, a replace. Again, not because you're trying to earn. Now, with all that in view, and that's a lot. I could probably stop talking right now, and we could just kind of meditate on that for a while. And if you're like, oh, yes, Jared, I've heard. God loves us, blah, 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 blah. You're not getting it. You haven't even begun to got it. Begun, begun to got it? Begun to get it? I think that's more proper English. And over the last several weeks, we've been talking about this idea. It's all based on that premise of the reality of who God is and that acceptance at the beginning that he didn't have to, but he chose to. All of that, it's based off of that. And we said, well, then we've got to start fueling it properly. We've got to start this replacement kind of a look. We've got to start examining and peeking under the hood of our lives and say, where am I putting all of my time, effort, and energy and fuel? Not because these things are bad and you should never do them, but because maybe it's just not as beneficial as I thought it was. Maybe what I'm actually looking at and wanting and desiring is not really the thing that will sustain me. Have you ever thought about that for a moment? For instance, I don't know why this example is coming to, head, to, to, to my mind, but it's kind of like when your children are young and they tell you, I want to be a professional musician, or I want to be a professional artist, or I want to be a professional football player, basketball player, baseball player. What does most parents tell them? That's great, but have a backup. Right? That's, that's great. But have a backup. Fuel something else just in case that don't work out. And that is the manner that we completely use. That's great. But it's going to fail you more than likely at some point. So you better have some fuel over here so you can figure it out on your own. That's how we treat this spiritual idea. Moreover, think of it even like this. The reason that we struggle with this replacement and we think we're trying to earn it is because we don't understand that story that I just said. Even moreover than that, we think that this thing that we want and desire, this natural life, we think it satisfies. We think it brings us to a proper end. I mean, it, it's, the, it's the real stuff. But yet, inevitably, every single one of us, if we're honest, and again, we've already talked about lying this morning, have reached and strived for everything you desire in the natural, and you feel like you have always came up short, or once you achieved the thing, it didn't quite make it. It just wasn't quite what you thought it would be. Has anyone ever built something up so much in their minds, and then when they experienced it, it was like, that was a letdown. 
How many of you are like, kids? Like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think of it this way. My grandfather, he traveled all over the world. And I went with him one time. I'd never been to California. And so he's telling me about these burgers from California. For years, he's telling me about these burgers from California called In-N-Out Burger. This was long before they ever came to Texas. And I was like, man, I'm thinking like this is like Whataburger on steroids. Like this is going to be a big, thick Texas, California burger, which means they put avocado on it or something. I don't know. Like, and so I, it is built up in my mind. And so we drive and we get to San Diego and we go to Encinitas, which is like a little surf town. And there is the In-N-Out Burger. It's the first thing we do, and we pull in, and we get it. We go through the drive through We park in the parking lot. And we're, I don't know. Why did we do that? Now I think about it. We were in that car for 24 hours. We could have just got out. But we sat in the car, and he's saying, oh, this is going to be so good. And I looked at it, and I was like, it's small. <laughs> I should have got two. And as I looked at it, I was like, and it's got salad dressing on it. Now they're good, and, you know, if y'all are like, no, because Caleb, don't talk to about in and out with Caleb. He loves it. And I took a bite, and it was like, I, I remember my grandpa was like, yeah. And I'm like, eh, it's good. You don't love it? I was like, it's good. It's just not what I thought. Now apply that to your life. You've went through life. You've looked at it. You've tried to get it. The second you've achieved what you thought you wanted, it just was like, mm, it's just, it's not what I thought. It's not what I dreamed it to be. You want to know why? Because you only got half of the picture. You only got this natural part. It was kind of like when some of us got married, and then you went through about six months or a year. It was like, it's not really what the movie showed me it was going to be. Or you end up going somewhere and doing something or achieving and graduating or whatever it is. And you're like, I thought this was going to fulfill everything. And you look at it and you're just like, but it's just not quite. Because that's only one side of the story. It's actually the lesser side of the story. And the real side of the story exists over here with this being called God that we were just talking about. And that fulfills that. And there's promises in that that says this will not be the thing that when you get there, matter of fact, you'll, you're, you're going to constantly think you've arrived and then there's just more to it. You're going to constantly think, now I've got to that point of achievement where it's going to be fulfilled. And it's like, I'm so fulfilled, but yet I want more. Kind of like if you eat really good food, not like an In-N-Out burger. But like a real good burger, you know, the one where you got to unbutton your pants a little bit because you're just still eating and you know you're not hungry. And your body is like, we're going to have to throw this up to keep eating if you want to do this. And you're like, but I got to keep eating it. Has anyone ever had a meal that good? That's more like what this is. It's like, I'm full. I'm satisfied in it. But yet I, I just want to keep going. That's what relationship with God looks like. That's what that communication of prayer looks like. That's what that place looks like when you're, when you're constantly in conversation with him. That's what it looks and feels like. It doesn't leave the dry taste of ash in your mouth of like it's just not quite there. And it together brings fulfillment and pushes you forward. And then you say, I'm willing to replace and to, 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 to I am willing to not go to in and out. I'll wait you know, I can go in and out real quick and just get it real quick, but it doesn't quite satisfy. I'll wait. So, this replacement, that's what we've been talking about. We looked at a guy named Elijah. We looked at a guy named Jesus. Y'all know about those two guys? The last one, surely. I've been talking about him today. But I want to look at, like, where did this whole idea, like, who thought of the idea of, you know what we should do? We should not fuel this natural body. And so what do we have? Food. Let's just not eat to understand what it means over here. Like, where did that come from, that idea? Now, most of you will look in Scripture and you'll be like, ah, oh, I looked up the word. I Google searched it. And the first fast is Moses. And you'd be so right if you weren't so wrong. That is the first place the word fasting appears in the scripture. 
it's the first place we, we, we get the explanation of someone not eating something and trying to uh, obtain something spiritual. But it's really not where the whole idea came from. The whole idea predates all of that. The whole idea goes all the way back to the beginning. That's the idea I want to just briefly talk to you about, or maybe not so briefly talk to you about, because all the rest of that took a lot longer. But I hope you got all that, because that's the most important thing I could ever say today. If you get nothing else of what I've just said, get that. But I'd like to tell you the story of where the concept came from, where the idea came from, of this exchange, of this replacement, of this decision. To say, set aside that, to grasp this. And it actually didn't start with natural food. It actually started with what we would call our internal being or spiritual food. Our thought process, our conscience, our mind, our internal being, our intuition. It's actually that decision. And this takes us back to a story, and it sets us in a place of a garden with a couple. A garden with a man and a wife. That's where we go back to. Now, some of you are like, I know this story. Bet you don't. Who knows the story? Let's tell the story. The first people ever created on the planet Earth were these people called Adam and Eve, and they were running around naked because it was a nudist colony. And they really enjoyed hanging out in the forest. And then they ate the wrong apple. It had worms in it. It was really bad. And then God was really ticked. And yeah, so they failed and you failed because they failed. You're just guilty of what they did. Like it's their fault. It's not your fault. You're the victim here. <laughs> now we're laughing, but that's kind of how we've understood the story. There's lots of things to the story. First off, just a fun note if you'd just like to, to know the history, because who's ever sat and wondered, like once you hit seventh grade biology, you're like, you're, wait, Bible, God, you're telling me you created two people and all of us came from the same two people? Because I'm pretty sure after they had kids, that gets some weird Arkansas stuff going on here. <laughs> Anyone with logic and reason say yes? Let me just help you out real quick. The Bible itself actually says that's not the case. Adam and Eve were not the first two people. It doesn't say how many. It just says God creates mankind. And then we hear the story of Adam and Eve specifically. Because Adam and Eve are in the lineage of that dude called Jesus. They're like the great ancestors of Jesus. Okay? So let's hear the real story, shall we? Y'all want to? I want to hear the real story. It's one of my favorite stories. All right, let's go. So remember this being that created all things, Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was up, form and void, darkness came from on the face of the deep, and the spirit of God moved on the face of the water, and God said, let there be light. Y'all remember all that? God created everything, seen and unseen. Remember that? Then he creates the trees, and he creates the oceans, and he creates everything. And in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, he created mankind. He said, hey, I'm going to create mankind, living, breathing souls that are like me, but not exactly like me. Their image and likeness, their characters like me, the thing about them that's going to look at the world and decide that it should be better, that's the part of me. Like the goodness part, I'm going to put that in there, and I want them to continue this good work. And all that happens. Now, when we get down to chapter 2, chapter 2 kind of opens us up into this story of this garden and this man and woman. And in chapter 2, we see, okay, everything's created, the earth is here, but then it goes and says, but let's tell you this story about Adam and Eve. Just for fun real quick, the word Adam in Hebrew is Adam, which just means man. Adam means man, kind, all of them. And Adaham, oh sorry, I've said that reverse. Adaham means mankind, like all of them, plural. Adam means one man. So now we hear the story of this one man, this one specific dude that we now call Adam. So what happens is this in verse 8. It says, now what God does is God plants a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put that man, Adam, who he had formed. And from out of the ground, the Lord made every tree to grow that was pleasant to the sight. Meaning, like, it was desirable. It was good stuff. I mean, it was, it was the best apples and the best oranges and the best avocados and whatever else. Do they even grow on trees? I don't even know if they grow on So all of these different things. Like, the best of the best, it looked, like, amazing. He said he created all of that stuff. 
Because it was good for food. It was good nutrition for the natural. There was also the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Wait, pause this story. This is a weird garden. Has anyone walked around and seen those two trees before? Like you're walking around, you know, and here you are at the grocery store. You'd be like, oh, oranges from Florida. And oh, yeah, oh, oh, would you look at that tree of knowledge of good and evil fruit? It looks so good. And would you look at that tree of life fruit? You ever seen it? No. So that you haven't been driving down the road and being like, who planted that tree of knowledge of good and evil? No. Why? It's not a real tree, guys. This is something, I know it's complex. The Bible uses something called symbolism. It's something that means it stands for the real thing, but it's not the real thing. Yeah? So, for instance, if I had a picture of my wife right here, and I held it up, and I put it on the big screen. I was going to do it, but I wanted to stay married the rest of the day. And I put a picture of my wife up here. What would we all say? There's Taryn. But is it Taryn? No, there's Taryn. And spiritually, we're like, wait, I don't understand. There's two Terrans. What have you done with Harry and Scarry Face? <laughs> we get confused spiritually, and we should not, guys. It's not hard. One represents the real thing. So when we hear about a tree of knowledge of good and evil, it is not a literal real tree that God created that he decided to take off the planet and go put somewhere else. It is a symbolism idea of saying it's, it's like this, it looks like this, it's the same concept. So you get it, you can see, and now you can identify the real thing when you see Taryn. If you had never seen Taryn, I said, that's what she looks like, right? Like mo- America's Most Wanted. And if she is, it's because I'm dead and she killed me. But you see it up there, what did they put the picture? It represents the person. You say, now if I see the real thing, I know what I'm looking for. And so scripture is chocked full of symbolism, things that it says, it's like this tree and the knowledge of good and evil and tree of life. It's like a tree. It's similar to it. It's not the thing itself. The real thing, now you know how to identify it. Make sense? So this garden seemingly had natural stuff in it, all the trees and food and stuff that's good for food, and it also had these other things that are good for food, this other fuel, And these other types of things, and one was the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Everybody following my story so far? Now, i got to explain the story because otherwise what y'all walk out of here with is people eating apples is bad, and that's why I just eat Little Debbie. (laughs) Now, it says all of this stuff is good, and in the middle of that garden, there's this natural trees and these spiritual trees. There's two things simultaneously acting as one together. And there's a river that flows out of the garden, and it parted and went into four heads, so it's given the description of these rivers that, that spread out and go all over the place and stuff like that. Okay, cool. So now we got this idea of this garden that is super lush, got all kinds of good stuff in it. It's got good stuff in the natural and good stuff in the spirit. Yeah? Y'all following? Now, if we skip down just a little bit further into verse 15, because the next part of it actually from, from verse um, like 9, 10 down to verse 15, it's just describing the rivers and where they go and all this kind of stuff. It's kind of giving you kind of some general geography here. But then right here in verse 15, it said, And God took the man, who? Adam. And he put man into this garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree you can freely eat, you can have my whole creation. You have everything. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of that one because the day that you do, you're going to die. Now let's break this down in the story. So God creates this crazy good place that has natural stuff and spiritual stuff. It's all working together as one. And he says, hey, I'm going to put this guy, Adam, I'm going to put him in there. I'm going to stick him in this place called Eden. And when I stick him in this place, called Eden, you can have it, the whole kit and caboodle. You can have the whole thing. It's all yours. I'm going to lay it all before you. The only thing is that one tree, that one spiritual thing, all the natural stuff, you can have it. The spiritual stuff, you can have the tree of life. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, I want you 
to not touch that. I want you to leave that for me. Now, where we're missing here a little bit is this whole idea of Eden. Now, i got to do a little bit. Who wants to feel really impressive and learn a little bit of Hebrew? Come on, you can impress your friends. (laughs) Raise up your hand. So, (laughs) you can impress your friends with this. But moreover, get the understanding of this. When you look at Hebrew lettering, the letters have meanings and the strokes that they have meaning. So like this is a D, E, T, O, X. Yes? Does D mean anything? There's no meaning behind our letter D. You're like, yeah, D says dog. No, it doesn't mean dog. That's just how you learn how to pronounce things. Right? D has no meaning. Does D-E have meaning? No. It takes, in our language, we have to put a bunch of letters together to get one idea. But in Hebrew, the way that they did things was every letter had a meaning. And then when the whole word was together, it had a meaning. So they built meaning off of the letters. Does that make sense? Uh, Japanese, Chinese are similar to this, where the strokes of the letters represent ideas, represent, and then together it kind of creates this whole thing. Remember? Symbolism? Remember, it's not the thing itself, but it's showing us what it is. The name Eden is one of the most important pieces of this entire story because it unveils the nature and the reality of what the writer is trying to tell us about this place man was originally in. He's trying to show us this combination of natural and spiritual as it's one, And he's trying to put it together and say, this is what it was like. So would you like to know what that meaning is? That meaning has four core words. It meant a spot for a moment where presence is an open door. Wait, 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 wait. That's confusing, Jared. It just says Eden. It was just this name. No. To the Hebrew people, when they wrote it out, that's what they were trying to communicate, this idea. They were trying to communicate this idea that Eden itself was like everything else was creation. But in this one moment, in this one place, this one spot, right here, there was a moment. There was something different about this one spot, this one moment. And there was some presence there. There was some communication happening there. And it created an open door. It was a spot for one moment where there was a presence that created an open door. And so when we're seeing this idea of Eden, it's not just this giant garden that man lived in. And, you know, the whole issue is now we live in cities. No, it's this idea That there was natural and spiritual things combined as to one. And in that place, when the spirit and the natural interacted together, God was there with man. We see it later in the scripture where it says, God, the voice of God walked and talked with Adam. Remember from the beginning, that bi-directional conversation? Remember that fuel source? It says that Eden was that place where everywhere the man went, Adam went, That spot, that moment, and that presence of God was a complete open door between the two. And they could communicate freely because these two things were one. And they were one because of this one core idea. This spot, this moment, this presence, this open door. They were one because at that moment, God had created everything, handed it over to man, and said, Go nuts. It's yours. I started this good work. Keep going. And he said, the only thing I need you to do is not touch this one thing. Because if you touch that one thing, you're going to die. Now, what does that mean? Remember, it's chock full of symbolism. It means at that one point, this is my one command. It's my one thing I need. If you do that, we're going to be ripped apart. If you do that, we can't be in a spot for the moment in my presence. We can't stay in direct communication if you choose to go that way. Now, what is this whole idea of this tree of knowledge of good and evil? 
and his tree of life. Notice, man could completely have the tree of life. Come on, there's so many stories. The fountain of youth. What, what do we want? To live forever. It's what we desire. Why? Because you came from a place that your existence was eternal. That's that spirit side of you. You came from that place. And so the entire idea was that you can partake of that eternal life. You can stay right here with me, right here with God, in this spot, wherever you go, in this moment, however often and however long, I can sit there as God and communicate with you. Don't you like that mankind? Who thinks that would be the most cool thing? Some of you are like, no. If you don't think that, you're crazy. The idea that the, I mean, how many questions would you have right now? Right? Who would think that's the coolest thing since sliced bread? Some younger kids are like, sliced bread wasn't a thing? <laughs> I mean, not since I've, it's always been. <laughs> but We're like, whoa, we could be right there with the creator of all things, everything answered, and we could just like chill, hang out. And, and munch down on all the great hipster foods that come off the tree. All the avocados. All the, 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 the pomegranates and the strawberries and the everything. And the, I'm not sure if steaks were on the menu yet. But, you know, it's a whole other conversation and a joke. Uh, <laughs> but it's like we could just hang out there. This would be something like we call, it's like paradise. Right? It would be cool. But there was this other thing we were not to partake of, and it's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Y'all follow me? I told you I was going to try to behave, but I'm not. I'm not doing a good job. It's okay. It's okay. Just stay with me. Just pay attention. Stop yourself. Keep your brain moving. Why was it called the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Guess what trees produce? <laughs> food. <laughs> they produce food. <laughs> going to help some people with basics of life. Trees produce fruit. <laughs> okay? Remember over here the other one? It produced fruit that was good for eating. Okay? So pre trees produce fruit. What do you do with fruit, Jeremy? You eat it. <laughs> you eat it. Right? So it says there is something about this tree that you can partake of. You can eat it. But when you do, know that it will separate us. No, just know that. And it was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, if we were to break that down in our modern ideas of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, we could basically say it this way. It is the decision to choose your own path and to say, I now get to determine and say, that's good, that's evil, I like that, don't like that. I get to decide. God's no longer the one telling me it's good. Remember, all the other verses, if you go read it, that can be your homework. Read Genesis chapter 1. All the other places, God is the one determining good. It's good, it's good, it's good. The one thing he says is not good is man by himself is a disaster. So let's put someone with him called a help me or a, 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 a helper, one together to work in unison together. It says that was the only thing. God was making all the calls of good and evil. God was the one deciding, this is good, I like it, it's going in the right direction, this is good. He said, but over here, you choose to partake of that and you start deciding, I can guarantee you, you're going to make some bad decisions. You want to know how I know? You're pretty new at this. I've been around for a long time. It's a joke because God's always been, and man was just created. So he says, don't choose that. Stay with me. We can stay together in this spot for the moment where my presence and we can talk and communicate and have a grand old time in relationship. All of us he said, but just don't start trying to make the decisions for yourself. Just rely on me. Replace 
your ability to choose what you think is good and right and the proper thing of life. Replace all of that with me. Allow me to lead and guide you. Y'all want it just in plain terms? This scripture is saying what God set before man at the beginning. Some of you, real quick. Some of you already. I just got to go on a little tangent for somebody right now. Some of you are like, well, why did God put the tree there in the first place if he knew we were going to be dumb? God should have just not put the tree there in the first place. Who thinks that would be a good idea? That would be called slavery. That would be called not getting free will choice. That would be called you're like the tree. You're like the animal. You have no choice in the matter. You're just doing what God already ordained you to do, and you have no capability for something that is grand called love. Case in point. My wife had the choice to say yes to me. I did not take her and lock her in a closet and say, you will and you cannot do anything else. You just have to do it. Behave. Now you're laughing, but that's basically what you just said you wanted God to do. You wanted God to remove the option of true care, love, and devotion, the very thing he is, that he said, yeah, I see all that betrayal, but I'm going to stick with you, and I know what you're about to do, and I know all the possibilities of it, but I'm going to stay with you, and I want you just to stay with me. I just want you to choose it. I want you to be like me and have the power to choose this. That's why he put it there. Not because he was like, oh, I created all this, and you know what? I want to create a grand story of tragedy, and I'm going to make them screw up at the beginning, and then I'm going to make them work for it, and I'm going to laugh and say, ha, 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 you can't get to me. That's y'all's weird, demented view of God. That's not what he did. He said, I want someone to love me back. I want to have this communion with someone who's like that, that has that capacity for true freedom of choice and love, devotion to another being beyond themselves. Not to a baseline principle of survival and kill or must be, you know, kill or be killed. I want someone that can say, no, I would be willing, because of how much you mean, I'd be willing to forfeit my own life in place of it. He said, because that's what I'm like. And uh, spoiler alert, in the story later on, he literally does that. And has a guy do it, his name's Jesus, to show you that. But that was the choice at the beginning and it had to be a choice. He says, this is the first fast. What I want you to do is it's setting there. You could choose me and hang out with me, or you can choose your own way. I'm telling you the answer. Choosing your own way is a bad idea. Stay here with me. What do we do? I'm going to risk it. And man decides, no, let's... Let's do it. I want to show you something just real quick. This is, this is my second marriage point. Remember at the beginning I said I'm going to help you with two things. Your marriage should be founded upon communication, your relationship. So all of you youngsters thinking about getting married, communication, communication, communication. Now, not properly like, oh, let's say the right words. I'm talking about open, pure, honest, sharing your heart with one another and never stop doing that. Because the second you do, you will be ripped apart because that's exactly what man did. We stopped the communion with God and talking to him, started listening to someone else. In the story, it's called the serpent. And we stop that communication and it rips apart. There you go, free marriage counseling. Just answered all of life's problems. But I want you to see something else. In the story, if you back up a little bit, after man was put in the garden and Eve was put there with him, it says that they were both naked and unashamed. It says they were both together, nothing between the two of them at all. What then came between them? When God was no longer the center of their relationship, of their communion, of their conversation, when God was not there, they chose their own paths, and they immediately were separated. If you don't believe me, go read the rest of the story, because as soon as they partake of it, they look at each other, they start saying, we're naked, this is bad, cover up, separate, and then they start blaming each other. Adam's like, it's that woman's fault. She's the devil. And then she's like, no, I'm not. It was that dude over there, like, right? And so they start all this point and blame, and they're separate. Why? The conversation was not united anymore. God was not the center of the communication, and they chose their own paths. So there you go, a little bit more extra marriage help. It comes courtesy of Taryn and I talking last night, and it was like, poof, saw it in the scripture. So there you go, congratulations on that. Now let's get back to our other story. Mankind decided, choose their own path. And from that moment on, God said, this is not good. 
Because now, if they keep choosing their own path and try to partake, if they try to have it both ways, if they try to partake of their own knowledge of good and evil, they start to be the arbiters of good and evil. They start to choose what they do and do not want. And they're also trying to be over here and partake of my life with me. They can't do that. They're going to stay in this split path forever. Later on in Scripture, you see it says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. It says they can't stay in this state. They can't stay separate from me, and they can't stay trying to do it both ways. I've got to now push the tree of life out of their reach for a little while. That spot for the moment where the presence of God is an open door, I've got to take it out of the equation because they're going to keep trying to go back and forth. They're going to want their way, and then they're going to stay here with me and says, that can't be. There's got to be a replacement. It's got to be a fast. There's got to be a swap. It's got to be a one or the other. Because I am a God, not me, I'm talking as God right now, to some of you. You should let this hit you where it hits you. Because I am a God that devoted everything. The God of all creation said, I'll dedicate myself to one species. Not every other species. Not all of my creation. He's not dedicated to the whole thing. He's dedicated to you. And he said, so in return of that dedication, no side pieces. I don't take, parents explain this to your children, I don't take whores and prostitutes. Come to me and be with me. This is not an open marriage with God. And he says, so I got to put that out of reach. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it means to step back into that commitment. I'm going to show you. Through this person of Jesus, I'm going to show you how you completely abandon and don't partake of that fruit. You replace it, you come over here, and you eat of the tree of life. The story of Christ is that journey back. The story of Christ. You want to know what? Jesus thought it was the case. You want to know how I know? Scripture after scripture. You want me to prove it? I'm going to. I'm not going to give you the choice. You're going to listen. No choice. It's not love in the matter. Shut up and listen to me. No, Jesus had it in his mind that that was exactly what he was doing. Jesus had it in his, his mind that he was quite literally redoing what was already done at the beginning, just showing you the right way. That was his whole consuming nature of what he thought he was doing. He says it so much in John chapter 14. He's speaking and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What does that phrase mean? Well, it's pretty interesting. In chapter 3, after man decides to go away and all that stuff happens, and God says, i got to put the tree out of reach, it says that he's got to block the way of the tree of life. This way of doing life has got to be separate because you keep choosing back and forth. they got to separate these things. And Jesus came and says, I am that way. Observe. I have abandoned all to obtain this. I'm going to walk it to the end to show you. And the end that he walked it to was to say, I'd be willing to give up the actual literal act of living. I'll be willing to do that. What I'd like you to do in replace of that is live as that same sacrifice. So I'll do the dying part, you do the living part. It's the basic most principle of all Christianity but it's the thing we breeze past and we, we complex it and we make it, oh, he had to die because Jesus, God needed a sacrifice and blood, bushcraft weirdness and blah, 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 blah. And we create all this complexity. And it was simply God saying, there's a man who said yes. There's a man who can walk it to the nth degree and won't say no to me. There's a man who put it back. And because of that, I'll resurrect him back. And my spirit is right there within him. And then you, your job is to do the reverse of that. He did it to a death you do it to life. So Jesus said, I am that way. That, that, that tree of life, that thing. I mean, quite literally, look at the symbolism, guys. We even call it, he hung on a tree. It's chock full of symbolism. I mean, it was a literal cross, which is made out of a tree. And we don't say cross all the time. We say tree more often than not. Why? By the way, that was not historically what they called crosses. They called them crosses. Over time, we started replacing it with this word tree. Do you want to know why? 
because that is drawing us back to the core story. Then we have other scriptures where uh, Peter, or no, Paul, sorry, Paul in Corinthians, he writes and says, there was the first Adam, and then there's this last Adam, and that is Jesus. What is that? The man created in the manner that Adam was created, and he's the last one that walked it out that way. Now you just live that way. There's other scriptures. You want to continue? I'm going to. How about this? Remember this eating and partaking of? Right? Remember? Don't eat and partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't choose your own path. Choose me. Choose life. Eat and partake of that. The natural stuff, it's all there. You can have it all, all of creation. I just want you to choose me. Don't choose your own way. Choose me. Don't choose your own way. Choose me. Jesus does this. It's something that we know very well called the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, he uses this exact analogy. And he says, hey, this is my body, that way, that tree. This is my blood, my life. This is it. And he says, partake of this. It's exactly what he's saying, drawing us back to this idea. Even more over than that, Luke 23. This is the, one of the most famous pieces of scripture that we have just gone. It went over our heads. But you're about to level up. You're going to be Beyonce, old school. Let me, let me upgrade you. We're going to level up. He's on the cross. Jesus is at the end. And it says that there's the thieves beside him. Who knows this part of the story? And one of them besides you says, don't forget me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus' response and how Luke wrote it is so brilliant. Symbolism pulling us back to the grand story of a God who created all things that said, I accepted you. Pulling us all the way back to that. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I want to point out two things. If you're not like someone who's been raised in church and has heard this argument, this won't matter to you. But for all you church folk, everybody's like, well, was it today or is it at the end of judgment day? And we missed the whole point. We're sitting here arguing over when. And the whole point was the word paradise. The word paradise is a kind of newer aged word at that time. It's a Persian word. And it means this. A pleasure garden. Do you want to know something interesting? If you were to put that back into Hebrew, it would be Eden. Literally on the cross. The way Luke writes it is to draw us to that story and say, you will be in Eden, a spot for the moment where the presence of God is an open door. You can be in that communion again. And we're sitting over here arguing like idiots. Again, clarify with your children. If I use language you are not accustomed to. Pretty sure I speak more cleanly than all of you do at your own homes, but <laughs> do you see that? Constantly trying to draw us back. Y'all want to go one step further? I'm going to go one step further. Even the book of Revelations. In chapter 2, it says, come and eat of this tree of life. Meaning the whole purpose is to get back to that, to saying yes to him, replacing it and saying no to my own path. All of the natural world is permissible, but that's only half the story. The real story is my bi-directional conversation with God, walking and talking with God. That's the real story. And in Revelation chapter 2, it says, I saw that tree and we can partake and eat of that tree. In, Je and in uh, Revelation chapter 22, it says, and I saw the tree there again, and it was planted by this river of eternal water, and I saw the tree of life on the other side of that tree. I was in the garden again. That's the whole story. Now, I want to ask you the same question I asked you earlier, which was who would be think it would be totally awesome to be able to walk right beside God in direct communication? And everybody said, yes, then why aren't you? Because Jesus allowed us and showed us that to the nth degree so you can right now. Then why aren't you? Because we are consumed with partaking of our own wills, paths, and desires. And it seems pleasurable to us, but it ends up as ash in our mouth. It's not quite the whole thing. And all we've got to learn to do is to set that side and come over here. 
That's the whole story. I just taught you from Genesis to Revelation. Some of you, it was your first time to understand God in that way and let that speak to you. Some of you, it was your, it was, you've heard it and you've heard it and you've heard it and it just hasn't quite hit home with you. And it's because you're trying to pull both worlds. You're trying to be the one that puts your path with, with the natural and with spirit and you're trying to go whoom, and put it all together and God says, I'm the only one that can do that. It's got to be done my way. But you got to choose it. I'm not going to force you to do it. I'm not going to make you do it because that's not what I wanted from you. I wanted you to be like me. And how I am is a constant devoted being that chose you from the beginning. So I just want you to choose me back.